get started. Thank you all for joining us um, today. Um, it is my pleasure to get to introduce uh, Lisa Placanica. Um, Lisa is the Senior Managing Director for the Center for Technology Licensing at Weill Cornell, um, where she oversees our activities in technology management, marketing, licensing, and the outreach that supports Cornell's goals in commercializing um, our technologies and innovations um, developed here, promoting startups. She joined Wild Cornell in 2020. Uh, prior to that, she was the Managing Director of Business Development and Licensing at Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, uh, where she was responsible for managing a team of business development professionals focused on identifying, advancing, and partnering uh, therapeutic technologies developed at the Sin Mount Sinai Health System and acted um, as a deal team lead for closing complex intellectual property transactions. Dr. Plaknika also uh, was a licensing manager in the Office of Technology Development at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she focused on the development and commercialization of cell and gene related innovations. Um, and uh, previously she was a key member of the Cell Biology Research Group at uh, Athersis Inc. in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, she is double red. Um, she received her PhD in pharmacology from uh, Wild Cornell Medical College, um, and she studied biochemical composition, where she studied co biochemical composition of gamma secretase and its role in Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, where she worked in the laboratory of Dr. Yuming Lee at uh, MSK. She also holds a BA in biology from uh, Cornell um, uh, in Ithaca, which I think probably most of us have heard of. Um, so, <laughs> um, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Um, we're really pleased uh, to learn about this interesting and important and expanding uh, part of the medical college. Great, thank you, Kurt, for the introduction. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, as, as Kurt said, I did my PhD work at Wall Cornell, so it's always interesting to be back in a position that's not a student and, and a, as a colleague and an instructor. So I hope that you find the information I share today beneficial and uh, fodder for further discussion. Uh, so here's the CME information. Uh, no one has anything to disclose. So I'm gonna give an introduction to academic technology transfer and what it is, um, and also an overview of WCM Enterprise Innovation, which is the group that uh, supports uh, and promotes technology transfer for Wall Cornell Medicine. So at its most basic, innovation transfer is really about taking early stage ideas that are developed within an academic environment, partnering them with a commercial entity who then develops that early stage research into a product or service that can ultimately benefit society. Um, if this kind of transfer process has been successful, hopefully a product will reach the market, benefit patients. If the company makes money doing this, a portion of that revenue is shared back to the academic institution. Uh, so as I said, a, a portion of the revenue does flow back to the institution. The institution does have to use that money to reward the inventors who developed the, uh, the basis for the technology. And the rest of the money is used to support the, the, the mission of the academic university. So a little bit of a civics lesson. Uh, so the Bayh-Dole Act uh, was a piece of bipartisan legislation that was passed in 1980. Uh, this transferred the right of ownership of intellectual property that was developed from federally funded research from the U.S. government to the academic research institution. Um, in exchange for this right to own uh, intellectual property that was uh, arose from federal funding, the academic research institution has certain obligations. Uh, we have to report uh, any inventions to the government. Uh, we have to agree to diligently protect and commercialize uh, the resulting technology. The revenue received must be shared with the inventor and must be used to support research and education and other academic nonprofit missions. The government retains uh, rights uh, in the technology. Uh, there's a preference for small, small businesses and US manufacturer and any relationship we set up around a technology uh, that arose from federal funding has to be what's referred to as a fair market value partnership. We can't do sort of sweetheart deals with best friends. It really has to be a, a fair market arm's length transaction. 
So why was this piece of legislation passed in the 1980s? Why, why does it matter? Um, if you look at the graph on the left, you can see billions of dollars are expended by the US government to support various research endeavors. Um, and then if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that the government owned about 30,000 patents that arose from federally funded research. So a huge body of innovation was developed and protected by the US government in the forms of patents. Um, but only a very tiny percentage of those patents were actually licensed and being developed commercially uh, in translating those research findings and early stage technology into products and services. Um, and if you, and of note, there had been no vaccines or drugs approved um, prior to 1980 that were based on federally funded research. And so the government said, hmm, there's a missed opportunity here, right? There's a missed opportunity to leverage the, the investment we've spent in research at academic research centers. We have not done or are not capable of commercializing all this research. Let's give the universities a, a try at this. And so you can see that in the, in the past uh, you know, 40 years, there has been a significant impact of academic innovation transfer on the public benefit. Um, just looking at the time period from 1996 to 2015, uh, you know, there's various numbers out here that really talk to economic development, um, number of jobs created, 380,000 plus inventions disclosed, 80,000 patents, lots of new companies formed. Uh, but for, for me, what the most impactful number is, and the number that really kind of gets me out of bed in the morning and excited to go to work, is that 200 drugs and vaccines uh, that were developed through public-private partnerships since the Bayh-Dole um, have been approved, right? So these are 200 drugs and vaccines that started somehow from federally funded research. A partnership with a commercial entity was formed. Now these are drugs that are on the market that are benefiting patients and society. Um, and it's not just limited to therapeutics. On the right, I've just listed just a few of the well-known uh, technologies that are now being used by the public for, for benefit. Um, that arose from federally funded research and this technology transfer process like Google and Gatorade, um, but really life-changing drugs like Lyrica and Remicade, CAR-T therapies, um, and, and you know, really critical advancements in, in biotech such as DNA splicing. Um, so, there, so this is sort of evidence that the passage by Dole Act was, was successful. It, it did what it wanted to do. It took you know, federally funded research investment dollars and enabled these research to be realized into products for, for patients. Um, so any, any academic center that accepts federal funds has to have an office that conducts technology transfer. Every office does it in slightly different over different ways. They might have different missions, they might have different goals, but every office has to do this. Um, and the success of the Bayh-Dole Act has been um, realized and now the similar models are being replicated in other countries within their own academic research centers. So while in the aggregate it has been very successful, um, you know, the reality is this is not easy. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a, a graph or, a, or an image um, that's, that's showing Stanford's innovation record since 1970. Um, so they were one of the first universities to engage in technology transfer even before the Bayh-Dole Act was passed. And while this is you know, looking at all of their, their technologies, um, you know, the same pattern or trend holds through even for life science and healthcare related technologies. Um, so you can see they've had maybe 10,000 technologies disclosed in the time period, 5,000 patents issued, but only 2,500 license agreements. So kind of relationships with the commercial entity were made around the intellectual property. And of those 2,500, only 77 generated more than a million dollars for the university in revenue, and only three generated more than a hundred million dollars. Um, so this kind of speaks to you, we can't be doing this just for the money. It's about kind of having shots on goal and being able to make best decisions and positioning technologies for success because it's, it's very hard. So we have to kind of nurture things along to really increase the chance of success. Um, and it's again, not about the money. It's about those sort of 2,500 relationships that are all an opportunity to have a commercial entity develop a product that can get in the hands of, a, of society and in our case, uh, patients and benefit, uh, benefit care. And it's not just academia that has this problem of being able to find the, the home runs and the successes. You know, here's just some quotes, some well-known inventors and well-known investors. Um, we don't have a magic crystal ball. Um, so we have to be able to take educated risk and educated chances 
um, because we do not know which one is going to be successful. And the, the goal is to partner as many technologies with as many entities as possible in the hopes that we can generate, uh, generate products. The other uh, thing to touch on when we're thinking about innovation is, is especially in the life sciences, is a really long time frame. Um, so the work that's getting done, the research labs and in the, in the clinic, you know, can be years and years and years. And then you get to the point where we have a technology or an asset that we want to do something with. Um, this is uh, Columbia's uh, technology uh, partnering record for about uh, 35 years. And you can see graphs on the, the left-hand side that it, it can take, you know, two to three to four years from the time a, an invention is being worked on at the university until it is actually partnered with a, with a commercial entity. Um, and the chance, if you look at the bottom panel on the left-hand side, the chance of it being partnered starts to drop off at a certain time point. So, so technologies that have languished within the university, there's a less likely chance that it's going to be partnered. So we have this kind of time paradox or window where we have, you know, it takes a little bit time to find a partner, but within that window, we really need to find the partner because then the chance of finding a successful partnership starts to drop off. The other uh, point to note is on the right-hand side is that even once you partner it, it can be many, many years until you're going to see any significant revenue generation from the license. Um, and that is assuming that it is a successful commercial product that makes it to the market. Um, and in the life sciences, many of these are therapeutics uh, that have to go through the FDA regulatory uh, process, which can take many years. Uh, you can see some of the graphs um, have a steep cliff and decline. And this really reflects that patents have a finite lifespan. And so there's a constant race against the clock of getting products developed in a time frame which they can be sold and still have patent coverage. Um, so many things to, to think about. So I've mentioned technologies, inventions, assets. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about that um, in the life sciences space? So obviously we're talking about therapeutics, such as small molecules, biologics, cell and gene therapy approaches, but also novel targets. If there's a really key clinical insight about a pathway uh, that is novel, that can be the fodder for de developing a novel therapeutic. Uh, medical devices, such as imaging equipment and methods, surgical devices, implants, uh, diagnostics, whether they're molecular diagnostics or, or protein or imaging-based diagnostics. But then there's an, a growing class of new innovations in the digital health space, so therapeutic alerts, clinical workflow aids, AI and machine learning algorithms are all the source of uh, potential technology development, as well as research tools such as mouse models, antibodies, research methodologies, uh, and, and data is also becoming an increasingly important piece of the intellectual property portfolio uh, when it is connected to digital health asset or diagnostics and, and other, other types of technology. There are multiple forms of intellectual property protection. I think most people, when they hear IP or intellectual property, they think about patents. Um, so that is certainly one of them. And in the life sciences space, they, it tends to be one of the most important intellectual property uh, protections you can seek in part of the intellectual property strategy. Uh, but there's also copyrights, trademarks, um, technical information, and tangible material. And this, this full complement of different types of intellectual property are what makes up the, the strategy we use when we're putting together a plan around a technology. Uh, patents must be proactively applied and awarded. Uh, there's patent law that covers what is patentable and what is not patentable, and it offers 20 years of protection. Um, this is particularly important for therapeutics, devices, and diagnostics. Um, copyright is another legal form of intellectual property protection. It automatically exists as soon as something is made. Um, it covers the physical manifestation of the work, and it's valid for 95 years from its first publication. Uh, copyright comes into play very often when we're dealing with software-related technologies and other things like clinical workflows and questionnaires, um, which can also be an important technology that can be partnered and developed. Uh, trademarks are less used by the university, but they're very, very important for companies. Uh, so a trademark is a legal form of protection. It exists upon use in commerce or registration, and it covers, you know, the recognizable sign or design uh, related to the product or the company. 
technical information and tangible material are less a legal form of uh, protection and, and more a form of intellectual property that you, you physically and tangibly have and you can convey to the other, the other party. Technical information is a very important component of all of the intellectual property transactions uh, we do. So this is the bits of information that are very important to understand how you would use an invention and how you would develop it that might not be captured in the patent application or the patent. So things like assays or protocols, unpublished data, sequence information, unique clinical or biological insight, and the, the rights and technical information are perpetual. Uh, tangible materials, also an important component of, of what we look at, um, often in combination with, with patents and other forms of intellectual property protection, uh, but even alone, if you develop a novel mouse model of disease, that in of itself can be partnered um, and, and licensed. So we're, we're interested in kind of anything within any of these categories. Um, Just an overview of Wall Cornell Medicine Research Overview, which most of you I'm sure are well aware of. Um, you know, a significant amount of funding flows to the institution to drive basic and translational and clinical research. You know, our faculty are top notch. We publish in top tier journals uh, and qu quite active um, in, in many areas. An overview of our intellectual property portfolio, uh, which might be interesting, it is a, it's, there's good diversification across the portfolio. About half of the um, patent pending assets or patented assets we have in our portfolio are what we would categorize as therapeutic related technologies. And the rest is really evenly split among the other major pillars, uh, like devices, diagnostics, research, research tools, and software. Uh, and we have technologies from many, many different fields. Oncology tends to be one of the, the larger uh, fields in which these technologies can be applied, but any field is uh, interesting and worth discussing with us. I mentioned Wall Cornell Medicine Enterprise Innovation. So our mission, what we're really here to do is to accelerate the best of biomedical innovation that's being developed at Wall Cornell to the market and translating groundbreaking research into revolutionary care through partnerships. Um, so this is our, our aspirational, our is inspirational mission and vision. So we wanna help and support uh, faculty, trainees and clinicians and researchers um, through this entire journey. So we do this through what I kind of call a seed, cultivate, protect, connect, and collaborate. These are our major strategies and processes that we do to help support, um, support you so we can execute on the mission. So our, one of our main goals is to foster an innovative and entrepreneurial culture through providing programming, education, and faculty and trainee engagement. So making sure that you are aware of what technology transfer is, of where, uh, commercially translatable innovation within your research or your clinical practice can be applied. Um, we like to cultivate those early seed ideas um, through really working with faculty and trainees to, to crystallize a development plan and how to take that early stage research and position it so it's, it's in, a, in a place to be partnered and further developed. Um, part of this is through building a robust intellectual property strategy around each asset. Um, and then the bulk of what we do, our external facing activities is really in this connect phase. Um, so once we have identified intellectual property that we want to invest time and resources into, our next job is to then go out and find a partner for that asset, whether that's with an existing company or starting a new code to develop the technology. Uh, so we do this through, you know, integrated business development strategy, um, strengthening our external networks, and then really finding and bringing a partner and, and forming that relationship. And even once the relationship is done and signed, you know, the work doesn't end, at least for enterprise innovation. Um, so, you know, we have rigorous post-execution compliance oversight to make sure the partner says they're going to do what they're going to do and that they, they provide revenue back to the institution if they are successful in commercializing it. Um, so our, our goal really with enterprise innovation is to be able to provide support and services across sort of this full spectrum and uh, make sure we're there to partner with you on kind of walking through, walking through this. Um, I did want to take a moment to connect, you know, the mission of what enterprise innovation is doing with obviously the, the, the 
three pillar mission of, of Wall Cornell. You know, I think one of the, the main focuses of our mission is really kind of supporting the discover pillar of the Wall Cornell uh, mission. So we're really there to kind of identify, nurture, and partner great groundbreaking discoveries, and then really enable dissemination for public benefit. If we've been successful with this, um, hopefully we can impact care um, by getting our technologies out there uh, to help patients, uh, both at Wall Cornell and, and, and beyond. And then throughout this entire process, we're really trying to also provide education and mentorship on innovation and entrepreneurship to faculty and trainees. And so making sure that uh, everyone understands what this process is and how to engage with us. Uh, so I, this is a detailed overview, which I'm not gonna walk through step by step, um, but I talked about the major buckets of seed, cultivate, protect, connect, and, and collaborate. And within each of those buckets, there's certain steps and certain activities that, that happen. Um, but you know, I, the, the, main, the main focus is really that you know, we wanna provide rich programming education and faculty engagement. Um, so there's many courses that the BioVenture eLabs, which is part of Enterprise Innovation, runs that touches upon entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, the Center for Technology Licensing, which I'm part of, runs a lot of webinars, uh, educational webinars on intellectual property and, and marketing. When we do get, you know, invention disclosure in, we really work with the with the faculty to kind of develop the value proposition around that technology to, to drive investment decisions and also to identify where there's gaps that need to be filled. And if we can bring resources, whether that's funding or other collaborations to bear to help advance that and, and grow and cultivate the, the technology further, we do that. Um, we obviously are responsible for developing and executing on the intellectual property strategy around all of the assets that have been brought into our portfolio. And then it's really the business development strategy. So who's the right partner? Where do we find them? How to, can we bring them in? And, and what does that relationship look like when we've gotten an interested party at the table? And as I said, once the deal is done, we, we're very active in, in tracking diligence milestones and making sure the, the product is developed the way we want it to be. So this is an overview of enterprise innovation. Um, some of these offices you may have heard of, some of them maybe you haven't. Um, the main Wall Cornell Medicine offices are uh, the Biopharma Alliances and Research Collaborations team headed by Larry Schlothman, who's very important, plays an active role in kind of seeding and cultivating um, early stage research collaborations to help kind of grow and, and nurture uh, technologies. The BioVenture eLabs, which is headed by Jahana Lee, uh, which provides the rich programming on uh, entrepreneurial activities and also has a lot of resources for faculty and trainees who are interested in entrepreneurship. The Daedalus Fund for Innovation is essentially Wall Cornell Medicine's gap fund. So when there's key experiments that need to be done to address a commercial or, uh, or patent question around a technology, we can draw on these funds to help advance the technology. And then the Center for Technology Licensing, which uh, I am part of, is really uh, responsible for kind of sourcing and seeking those, those technologies from the, from the medical college, uh, and driving the business development strategy around them. So it's all about sourcing them, developing them, and then partnering them. So an overview of really kind of what's this roadmap look like? Who's involved when? Um, so the innovator, so the inventor is, is involved through the entire process, essentially. Um, it obviously starts with uh, the research uh, that's happening in, in the laboratories and in the clinic. Um, and they're the ones who have to have that idea that, gosh, this could be something. Um, and then they engage with enterprise innovation. Um, and enterprise innovation, if it's deemed to be something that we want to invest time and resources into, we'll bring it into the portfolio and they take over doing the heavy lift on intellectual property strategy, commercial outreach and due diligence. But throughout that process, we still need the innovator to be involved, right? So I am a scientist, but I can't explain the science of the uh, inventor as well as the inventor can. And the commercial entities we work with, they, they want to speak with, with the, the key opinion leader and the one who knows the technology the best. So there's often back and forth, but our office does the heavy lift on, on setting all of that up. Um, and then hopefully we find a partner who wants to take forward the project 
and they're responsible then really for the commercial development and ensuring a product makes it onto the market. So this life cycle is, is very long um, and a lot of people have to come together to make it happen, um, but it is a, definitely a worthwhile endeavor. So this is a slide from the, from the beginning. As I said, a portion of revenue from successful commercialization, commercialization rewards and vendors and flows back to, to Wall Cornell. And I highlighted revenue and commercialization and rewarding and flowing to the institution. Um, because while this does happen, whenever there's money involved, things can get complicated to say the least. Um, one of the things that we have to be very careful of is conflict of interest. Um, so I've just thrown up some random, you know, news articles about, you know, uh, conflict of interest matters that have arisen uh, in, in the public, uh, public eye and the impact on that. So these are not the types of New York article, Times articles or other articles that uh, Walt Cornell wants to be involved in. Um, so we take very seriously how we how we do this process, how we do this technology transfer process and really understanding what the conflict of interest for the, the inventor could be and what the conflict of interest for the institution could be and make sure that they are, are suitably managed. Um, you know, so this goes kind of as of just because it's legal doesn't mean we can do it. Um, so there's special attention required for academic licensing and, and startup formation, which might be restrictions that, you know, a pure commercial entity doesn't necessarily need to think about because it's legal. Um, but it's not something that in maybe is what I would say is in keeping with the nonprofit ethical standards of an academic research institution. Um, so everything we do within the licensing office and enterprise innovation, we're always having an eye to managing both the inventor and the institutional conflict of interest. Um, we have to uphold the principle of development and dissemination over money. We have to say, okay, we will you know, happily take less money if it means that you're going to develop this pro you know, product in a, you know, a underdeveloped country. Um, we have to take global social responsibility into account, and we always have to protect human subject data and tissue. And that is part of a collaborative effort or partnership that we're setting up. And so that also means that enterprise innovation must coordinate and collaborate with multiple Wall Cornell offices to affect our licensing. So we can't do this in a vacuum. Um, it requires coordination with the conflict of interest office, uh, OSRA and the clinical trials office, general counsel, the research integrity office, um, when we're dealing with, with patient data, with track and accord and IRB and privacy office. Um, so all of these entities have to come together and make sure that we understand what we're doing, what the technology is, what the impact is, and that it meets what I will call the moral standards of, um, of something that Walt Cornell wants to be associated with. And, and that takes precedence over money, essentially. That said, in my own personal opinion, I think despite the potential for conflict, I think academic innovation is a necessary endeavor. I think you know the record kind of speaks for itself in the, the public good that has happened for it. Um, on the right hand side of just you know the uh, the mRNA vaccines uh, for COVID actually arose from the basis of that is academic uh, research out of UPenn and some other other universities on the foundational mod RNA technology, right? So I think. You know, this endeavor is a, is a necessary one. I think we just have to be aware of, of the potential for, for conflict um, and making sure we're always on the right side of the, uh, I'll call it the moral line. Uh, for, for those students who are, are in, the, in the audience today, we launched uh, this, this semester a one credit course uh, that provides hands-on training um, and the fundamentals of academic business uh, development. So working closely with the CTL office on the major pillars of activities that we do and, and really getting hands-on training. Um, so it's, it's great if you're interested in looking at your science from a different lens and understanding how that lens is applied. It's also useful if you're thinking of uh, alternative career paths. Um, right now, this course is open to MD, PhD students who are in their PhD portion and uh, PhD students who are post-ACE. Uh, we're working to expand um, this course or a similar course to, uh, to other students and, and to postdocs. Um, but we're always happy to have an informal discussion and answer any questions that you have. And uh, as I said, we do a lot of programming events between the uh, BioVenture eLabs and CTL. Um, so if you have 
you know, if you're interested, you can attend those. If you have suggestions for things that you would like to see presented or do, you know, please let me know. And we can certainly try to integrate those into future, future programming efforts. And so with that, I, I think I can open it up to questions. Um, so, you know, our goal at Enterprise Innovation is to work together with really all stakeholders. So our internal stakeholders and our external stakeholders and, and hopefully get early stage research that's happening here into the hands of a commercial entity that can, can translate it into a, a product or service. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I, I have uh, heard talks like this several times in my career at Cornell, and I have to say, um, yours is by far the clearest and the best that I've heard. So uh, thank, thank you, you very much for tackling a really complicated subject and for putting it into uh, the context um, of, of where it sits nationally in terms of, uh, you know, the, the uh, Bayh-Dole Act and things like that. Um, I, I have a question um, about uh, institutional conflict, and it has kind of a, a couple different dimensions to it. Um, so um, one is, how, why is it that we only define conflict in terms of money? Because my experience is that some of the most complex conflicts that we have have nothing to do with money. Yeah, I, I don't know if we would define it just as money. Um, I think it's probably anything where there's a power decision-making imbalance that the, the institution can be involved in or connected with can be, can be a source of a conflict. I, you know, within enterprise innovation, the source of conflict that I'm generating is hopefully money um, or the promise of money or the potential for money. Um, so that I think that's why I focused on, on the, the revenue uh, section, which I think is, is complicated, but you know, that gets wrapped up um, essentially with research integrity, because oftentimes when we set up a, a new company, or even if we do a licensing relationship with an existing company, there's often a sponsored research component um, that goes back to the laboratory. Um, and so you have to ensure that that research is truly free research that's happening and not necessarily being painted in a certain light to promote whatever the company wants it to promote. Um, because of the financial interest in gain. So I think it, it's the conflict of interest is very complicated to say the least. Yeah, all right. So, um, I mean, I don't wanna uh, make this overly centered on, on my own experience, but um, you know, I, I, I work, do a lot of advising over at Cornell Tech. And um, uh, so there are, I guess, four companies now that, I'm, that I uh, advise. Um, and I just do it as a faculty role. I have no financial interest. And as you probably know, but maybe the other students here don't know, um, Cornell Tech students own their own IP, um, which is not true of students at Wild Cornell or in Ithaca. Um, and, um, you know, that is essential to their program because essentially their program is to create a company. Like that's, that's what they're there to do. Um, so I have a real interest in, um, with a small eye in supporting these young companies. I'm fascinated by them. I help them, uh, you know, through their, their masters and I want to see them succeed. Um, in one, at least one case, um, a company developed a, a technology that we use here at Wild Cornell um, and the hospital owns stock <laughs> in another company that competes with them, um, but has absolutely no historical development interest in it. So that to me is, you know, so the hospital has a genuine financial conflict of interest. I have no financial conflict of interest, but I have a, but I have a conflict of small eye interest. I think our product is better than theirs. Guess which one's getting installed? Um, <laughs> it's the one that where there's a financial conflict of interest. So, and what I, you know, what I don't know is how do you, you know, how do you manage institutional conflict? So in this case, it's NYP that has the conflict, but it's Cornell that suffers the consequence. Yeah, I think that that's hard, especially NYP, which is a, you know, there's a complex relationship between them with NYP and, and Wall Cornell and, and Columbia. Um, you know, I think, you know, there are plans essentially that had to be set in place. And the institution, Cornell University and, and Wall Cornell have been working on a formalized institutional conflict of interest policy. Um, you know, to address many issues like this, right? And this comes down to, you know, for me, it's sunlight, right? So making sure everything is out in the open is one 
and this is my own personal opinion, sunlight, right? So making sure everything's out in the open, everybody understands what's going on and then independent analysis, right? So the people who are making the decisions of what product should be used should really truly have no connection to um, the financial interest, right? And so if there's an so independent you, expert yeah. board. Okay, so now I agree with that point. Um, so how do you how do you do that when the institution owns stock, or the or owns intellectual property? Like you know. Yeah, so I mean, I think if it's truly an ind- even if it's an institutional employee, as long as it's not an institutional official, right? So there's there's those who are institutional officials, right? And maybe you could say they're conflicted because they you know look more at the bottom line if the investment's going to make money or not. Whereas an institutional employee who should be exercising their clinical or research judgment on which is the best product to deploy, that, you know, that should be, there should be a disconnect, right? Um, And obviously, like, sometimes it has to do with reporting, reporting lines, right? So if somebody reports directly to somebody, you know, they might feel the pressure to go one way or the other because they're worried about their job, right? So I think it's, it's a very complex, um, process to set a management plan in place. Um, so these are all things that the, the conflict of interest and the research integrity uh, teams are, are working on, on, on policies and processes, on how you set up the plan to manage these types of conflicts. And sometimes the conflicts can't be managed. And that's part of the analysis of the CAP and the COI to say this can't be managed. Um, but the goal of the CAP and the COI is, is not to have, a, I, I think the goal, and this might be good to have them come in and talk, um, is not to have a knee-jerk, no, we can't do this. It's can we do it in a way that can be managed appropriately where there's transparency and we're still within what I would call the ethical, moral line which in which we want to be. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping some others might speak up on on, on this subject. So I'm going to I'm going to keep saying some things that hopefully are are radical enough that someone will argue with me because uh, I don't mean to. I don't want to beat up on you. Uh, uh, but I mean, I personally think the, that if you know if a, if a technology was developed here, it, we should have a bias towards evolving that technology internally. I actually think that's okay, but I understand that it is super, super complicated. And um, I don't think it's okay, you know, for doctors to buy stock in the drugs that they're selling. Or actually, if you've read the New Yorker last week, um, shorting a stock um, Mm -hmm. as one of our faculty members has done. Um, So, and and he actually looks good. And if you know, those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there's a great, great article in the New Yorker last year, last week um, about a, uh, I guess it's a, a drug company that appears to be uh, essentially fraudulent and was exposed in part by the work of a Wild Cornell faculty member. Um, so, um, and he shorted the stock. And I, I actually don't think on our conflict of interest forms, I'm not sure, I don't think you have to reveal a short position. <laughs> I think you'll I don't know. An ownership position. <laughs> that would be an interesting thing to, to, yeah. to follow up on. Um, so, um, okay, so shifting gears a second, um, what do you have a sense of how much it costs to administer tech transfer versus the direct value received? I, I understand there's lots of indirect value in, in helping society, et cetera, but um, in terms of the cash in the door. Yeah, it- so the, the ugly truth is probably, I think, less than half of tech transfer offices actually make enough money to cover their operating expenses. Um, So it is an expensive investment. Um, You know, patents alone are quite costly, right? So if you think of a a standard going from filing your first U.S. provisional application to getting an issued U.S. patent in the life sciences and say chemical arts, you're easily looking at 10 to $20,000 easily. And that's just in the U.S., right? So if you want to file it in Europe and Japan and Canada and China and other places, the, the costs just start to multiply um, significantly. Uh, so it is it's expensive. And then, you know, the you know, the, the professional you have to have professional teams handling this. Right. So there's the cost of the personnel to do this. Um, it's expensive. Right. So if you look at it from that lens, it's like, why would anybody invest in this? This is dumb. Right. Um, however, right. What you're investing in is the potential opportunity to take 
many educated shots on goal and hope that A, you get products on the market, whether you make money or not, because this can't be a money-driven focused mission. Um, but hopefully one of those will be a big winner and cover all of your losses, just like a venture firm, right? An right, adventure, right. A venture firm, if they make three to four X on investment, that's considered amazing. And the ones they make a 10 X on cover all of the other losers, right? Um, and so that's what they're banking on, making educated investment decisions, not only to initiate an investment, but when to pull the plug on an investment. Um, and so that is what we are um, essentially here to do is, is help make those educated investment decisions for the university. Um, and the goal is to be risky, take risks, because you can't be risk averse in this, um, but to know when to say, okay, I have I've gathered enough commercial feedback. I know we're not going to be able to position this until we get data X, Y, and Z, and that's not going to happen. So let's discontinue investment in this and focus on this, right? Because time and money are, are a finite, a finite resource. And so we have to strategically look at the portfolio and make decisions on what is the highest likelihood of success, knowing that success in and of itself is hard to reach if you're looking at pure money as, as a success factor. Right. Um, Dr. Fine. Um, I don't know if you're able to give me a sense of this, but there's been a lot of discussion about uh, having uh, President Biden, for instance, uh, deal with vaccine patents so that, in fact, uh, products could be made uh, in some of the developing countries uh, which are experiencing great uh, you know, shortages of vaccine. Um, could you dissect that? I mean, how, how does that work in terms of patents? And does the president have a right to override uh, the patent situation? Um, and how else might it be uh, adjudicated? Yes. So that's a, that's a great question. So this goes back to the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, and if you remember, I kind of listed all of the requirements and obligations, and one of them was retained government rights. Um, so the government right always retains, the government always retains the right to kind of practice the invention for themselves, um, the non-exclusive right to do that. Plus, they also have retained what is called a marching right. And so if in the case of a national emergency, the government feels the commercial entity has not fulfilled its obligations to the public, um, they can march in and take the invention, essentially, take a, basically override the patent rights, the, patent. Uh, the, the, the company's exclusivity to the patent rights. Um, in the you know, 40 plus years that the Bayh-Dole Act has been enacted, the government has never exercised their marching rights. Um, they came the closest um, for a rare disease drug, actually from Mount Sinai, um, that the commercial entity um, couldn't manufacture it. They kept getting contamination in their biologics facility, couldn't find it. It was negligence, really, to be honest. Um, and there were patients with rare diseases who were dying and they didn't have access to the drug. And the government came close to saying, okay, you guys messed up, we're just gonna do it ourselves. Um, and they didn't. This might be a case where may, who knows, maybe there's the government decides to exercise a march in rights if they can't, if they feel they can't get a suitable uh, concession or agreement from, from, the, from the companies. Thank you. And, and, with that, and I'll, just, I'll just say this only applies for inventions or licenses and patents that are connected to government funded inventions or technology within the vaccine space. Right. So that was where my question was going. I mean, and, and how inclusive of, is that? I would think that, you know, uh, that almost everything could probably be traced back to some government funded component. Yeah. So there are, I mean, there are very kind of rigid reporting obligations. So it is very clear what the government has rights in and what the government doesn't. So any patent application that arose from a federally funded invention has a very specific clause in the front of it that says, I don't remember the verbatim, but it has to be written verbatim correctly in the patent application says the government has, you know, this was funded by grant number, blah, blah, blah. The government has certain rights in this invention. And so it's very clear which patent applications trace back to government funding. Um, and to the point where there's been other instances where that government 
rights clause hasn't been included in patents, and that can be grounds for invalidating the patent. Um, and there have been cases in kind of, I think, drug pricing kind of wars and uh, activist investors who try to invalidate patents because that they traced something back and realized it was government funded and it wasn't in this one application, you know, out of a hundred that cover a product and trying to invalidate that patent, right? So the reporting obligation is very, very important. And the institution can get in a lot of trouble if they are not adequately reporting inventions. So that's why it's very important, you know, if, if you're a faculty or trainee, you disclose an invention to my office, you have to let us know any funding that touched that invention because it puts the, the school's funding in jeopardy if we're deemed not to be reporting uh, technologies that arose from government funding to the government. Um, okay, Wolf Ford has a question um, and I'm trying to unmute him. I'm, um, I'm unmuted, I'm okay. unmuted. Uh, thanks for um, <clears throat> great presentation. I, I, you know, I thought the, the, the chart that you showed with the Stanford um, sort of breakdown of like how many patents versus how many things actually get monetized, um, you know, was very enlightening. And I think one of the things that this makes me think of is some of like the, the difficulties in developing um, drugs or products such as antibiotics, where oftentimes, you know, you hear a lot about how there's no sort of financial interest for a company to um, invest in a new drug that sort of its success is contingent on never using it or using it as sparingly as possible, et cetera. Um, is there any kind of effort to address those kinds of issues within the framework of the Bayh-Dole Act, or would that, you know, is that something that would have to be tackled separately, or you know, how do you, how do we sort of square the circle um, with cases like that where there's this competition between financial incentives and sort of societal needs? Right. Yeah. So that's a great question. As a medical consumer, like I'm terrified of antibiotic resistance, and I don't understand why you know, companies and investors refuse to invest in. Um, but I think less so from the Bayh-Dole uh, perspective and probably more through other governmental means like FDA regulatory breaks, right? Like if you look at, um, you know, FDA programs that support rare and orphan disease drug development um, and tropical neglected diseases, there's financial incentives in the form of like, fast track regulatory approvals, vouchers for kind of skipping the line um, that have really promoted rare, you know, made rare disease drug development lucrative. And then there's a lot of investment in rare, rare disease, right? That gets into a whole nother mess because then you have to get, talk about reimbursement and, you know, if it costs $50,000 a month to treat a patient, is that worth it? Right. But at least there's, in, there's now financial incentives that have been set up uh, for companies to develop rare and orphan uh, disease drugs and, you know, neglected, neglected diseases through kind of the FDA regulatory um, path, different than the Bayh-Dole, right? Because at the end of the day, the, what Bayh-Dole does is give the university the right to try to commercialize a technology. Uh, but we can only do that if we have a commercial entity who's willing to take on the further investment, right? So we might invest, you know, if you count research grants, maybe there's a couple hundred thousand dollars in research grants, you know, and then the operations and the patent expenses to file something and maybe some development funding. So maybe we invest, say, you know, $500,000 by the time we partner something with a commercial entity. Well, the commercial entity then has to take that and take it all the way through FDA approval, which we all know is lengthy and costly, right? So they're not gonna do that if they don't see an opportunity for financial return. So the Bayh-Dole Act doesn't really give us the, the levers we need to kind of promote, to promote that. Got it, thank you. I, you know, you're, this reminded me of um, a talk that I went to many years ago after the era of funding. So, um, you know, uh, after the last financial collapse, when uh, the government sent out a gazillion dollars in grants called the through the era grants, there was pressure to measure the research impact of that investment. And schools suddenly started to having to report, you know, what was the value delivered from the era grants. And someone from Stanford spoke um, about, um, used, went through the logic of the government reporting and um, described how much money was added to the economy through the invention of Google. 
and pointed out that zero dollars would be credited to Stanford uh, because he dropped out yeah. <laughs> and didn't graduate. <laughs> so, yeah, it's how the, the I'll call it the metrics discussion, particularly in technology transfer, is it's complicated, right? Because we're always comparing apples and oranges, but everybody wants to compare what you know, University X is doing um, and what are really the what are really the ways to measure kind of success um, in the short run is hard, especially in the life sciences, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, what you're looking for is product on the market and revenue to the institution, but that's like a 25 year horizon. So how can anybody measure what we're doing today is going to kind of get us there. So that really takes kind of faith and belief in sort of the process and the investment that's needed to kind of get there. I'd be interested in knowing uh, subjectively, you know, about the those 70 uh, inventions that earn more than a million, you know, which did they contribute more than the three who brought in a hundred million in terms of their social contribution? That I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's in, I don't think in that Bloomberg article, it says which, um, which are those winners? I mean, Google was one of Stanford's winners, right? Because they had stock in Google. Um, uh, but I, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's it's interesting. And I mean, it, I, most of the home runs institutions have had where they bring in hundreds of millions in in revenue. And I will point out, almost always the revenue drivers royalties, so payments for the sale of a product, not equity. Equity is like a little cherry on top that you get a little extra money for, but the real money that's going to be made by a university is always in the, almost always in the royalties, at least in the life sciences space. Um, But the, yeah, most of the ones that have made money have always, always been therapeutic drugs, right? Because if you look at the, just the pricing, there's probably some outliers, especially now with kind of other technologies coming online and digital health, I think is going to be interesting to follow in the next, you know, decade or so. Um, But historically therapeutics are are where the money comes to institutions. Mm -hmm. And that's, but that's also why we can't be money focused because we have an obligation and a moral obligation to really try to commercialize any technology that walks through the door. Right. Um, So we are, we can't be just myopically focused on therapeutics, right? Because it's also a portfolio play. We want kind of a balanced and diversified portfolio. Interesting. Great. Um, uh, Any other questions? before we wrap up. Um, Okay, Uh, thank you again. Um, uh, This was really uh, wonderful. Um, Next week, um, our guest is gonna be uh, Anna Malino um, from uh, UCSF. um, And she's going to be talking about the privatization of Medicare from Medicare Advantage to direct contracting. Um, For those of you who are particularly interested in in this um, talk today, um, I'll call your attention that in two weeks, uh, Steve Cohen will be speaking on the role of private equity in academic medicine. And then uh, in mid-March, we'll be having another uh, discussion about private equity and the impact on um, uh, nursing homes. Um, So uh, this has really been a a great talk, particularly in the context of this uh, series that we're doing, Um, really very enlightening, um, and I appreciate uh, um, the detailed um, and clear explanation. My pleasure. I just dropped my my email in the chat, so if anybody is interested in exploring this more, has further questions, um, is interested in in the courses we offer and the programming, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you all for your time. Thanks. Have a great day. Okay. Bye.